Fantastic. Well, thanks for joining us, everyone. Um, this is the penultimate um, uh, one of our uh, webinars for this uh, this year. We're, um, we'll start again after Christmas. Um, we're delighted to be joined by uh, Jess Britton today, who is one of our um, executive committee. Uh, she uh, wrote a report, um, was it last year or two years ago that you wrote the report, Jess? 2019, yeah. 2019, yeah. Uh, with uh, Basha, uh, I'm going to pronounce this correctly, Sejuska? Sejuska, I think. I'm sure she would pronounce Sichewska. it slightly differently, okay. but Sejuska. Yeah, uh, and Julie Smith um, from Exeter. Um, their report uh, was written with the UK Energy Research Centre and the Exeter Energy Policy Group. Um, and it's entitled Power Shift, How to Build Gender Balance in the Energy Research Portfolio. And I believe um, Jess is going to be talking to us about that work today um, and kind of reflecting on, um, uh, on what it means two years on. Um, Jess is a research fellow in the local and regional energy systems theme of the UK Energy Research Centre and currently her work is focusing on local governance and policy for smart, flexible energy systems. In the past though, she's examined heating networks in the UK and Germany. Um, she's currently based at Edinburgh University in the School of Social and Political Science. Uh, and as I say, she's, uh, she's a member of our team and we're very lucky to have her. So um, take us away, Jess. Thank you very much for joining us today. We're looking forward to, um, to hearing uh, your talk. Oh, and a, and a reminder, everyone, sorry, if you have any questions, please feel free to post them in the chat during Jess's talk. Um, alternatively, uh, I'll field questions at the end. OK, yeah, that would be great. I don't think I'll be able to see the chat when I'm presenting. Um, but yeah, I look forward to the discussion a little bit later on. So I'll, I'll put my slides up in a moment and um, I will present based on the report that um, Peter just mentioned. Um, it's really nice to be here and join you all today. Um, but um, I've got quite a lot of caveats about what I'm going to be presenting. So I'm, I'm really keen to kind of hear from you and to um, draw on people's experiences from um, elsewhere in the world and from um, other disciplines as well. So if I share my slides and get started, hopefully you can see those slides now. If there's any uh, problems as I go through, please feel free to unmute and shout so I, uh, <laughs> so I know. Um, but as Peter said, so I'm going to be talking specifically about a piece of work that myself and my colleagues Julie Smith and Basha, Basha Sichewska carried out in 2019. And we also um, worked very closely with Professor Catherine Mitchell at the University of Exeter as well. Um, so I want to kind of acknowledge um, all of our work together on this project. And it was quite a specific piece of work that was funded by the UK Energy Research Centre over a period of about, um, I think it's about nine months with uh, the three of us working part-time on it, to look at gender balance within UK energy research. But um, I'll kind of use the work we did as part of that research to also reflect a bit about uh, the gendering of higher education institutions as well. Um, if I just move on slightly, it's worth saying that um, I would class myself as a geographer, an energy geographer. Um, I'm currently ba based in a sociology department. Um, and this report, although quite uh, focused, um, I'm really keen to think more broadly about how it links to kind of other aspects of diversity and in intersectionality as well. No problems moving my slides on at the moment. Okay. So the core question that the work we carried out considered was whether women are underrepresented in energy research funding. Um, and to explore that question, we wanted to consider the allocation of research funding for energy research and the lived experience of female academics. So we spent some time reviewing the really very extensive literature on diversity more broadly and gender specifically within higher education institutions and within research. Uh, we then went on to spend quite a long time analysing data on women and funding, uh, interviewing a range of female energy academics at various uh, career stages, 
And then we produce this report that aimed to mobilize change and support decision making in funders and institutions. So it had um, quite a kind of instrumental aim in terms of uh, developing a range of recommendations for change. And, and that is what's contained within that report that the images in the bottom right corner and the link to the report as well. Um, but I want to kind of acknowledge that e even the idea of researching the energy research area is complex. It's a hugely diverse landscape with a range of disciplines, a range of approaches. Um, and identifying how we place boundaries within that research landscape is complex and I'll reflect on that a little bit and clearly the um, the issues related to, to gender balance are very complex and intertwined with lots of other diversity and inclusion issues. I would also say that everything I'm saying today is contextualised in the case that um, all the things I'm saying are, do not apply to all women and they do not apply to only women so they relate to a lot of other issues um, in terms of of um, structures of higher education and funding. But one of the core messages I want to start with is that the story I'm telling throughout this presentation is not a new story. There are many studies and reports over many decades on the evidence for the barriers and biases that many women encounter in research environments. Um, and some of the reports that I've highlighted there include uh, the UK government's uh, report in 1993, which was realising our potential, which particularly focused on gender in STEM subjects and identified a range of uh, challenges and barriers to be addressed. So it gives you an indication that, you know, for almost 30 years, this has been um, a relatively um, well-known agenda within studies of funding structures. And then the reports there from uh, Kathleen Grogan and Savanick and Davidson, um, are just two of the very many reports that, that set out quite nicely, I think, um, the kind of body of evidence that's developed over the years in terms of how some of these barriers and biases might operate and where the uh, bodies of evidence lie. Um, I would also say, in addition to increasing studies and reports on what barriers and biases might be, there's an increasing number of kind of reports and commentaries on what the impacts of a lack of diversity might be. So recognizing that a lack of diversity, including gender diversity, inhibits research innovation and ultimately might limit growth. So um, there's really now quite an established um, body of studies looking at how diversity results in better outcomes, both research outcomes in terms of innovation and team dynamics, but also within the private sector in terms of diverse teams um, leading to more innovation and improved outcomes as well. Um, and the data I want to include there, this is not energy specific data. This is within the UK, the whole higher education populations. So we can see from that that um, the most recent data for, them, for that, and that's from the Higher Education Statistical Authority, so this is all publicly available data, um, undergraduates, uh, female undergraduates represented 57% of the total pop undergraduate population, 58% of postgraduates, so um, that's both taught and research postgraduate programmes, 47% of academic staff, um, and 28% of uh, professors are female. So we can, we can see that there's drop off at very different career stages already. And I think it's particularly significant to note within that, that um, within the, the total UK population of professors, only 2% of professors are um, black women. So clearly we know that there are long-term issues around gender diversity uh, within higher education and research, but why study en energy and gender specifically? Um, there's been a range of work kind of developing this idea of why energy might be particularly in need of further study. So firstly, there's, um, as I mentioned, quite a lot of studies looking at the very contained disciplines, particularly STEM disciplines, things like maths uh, and engineering, uh, but less looking at interdisciplinary subjects such as energy um, to understand how gender and diversity might be being experienced. 
Um, further to that as well, in 2014, um, Subcool carried out an analysis of um, just under 4,500 energy research articles, um, I'm just admitting someone, which concluded that less than 16% of authors identified as female and none of those authors reported training in women's studies, feminism, gender studies or related disciplines. So I think obviously that's, that study is slightly dated now, but it gives you an indication of a kind of active uh, researchers publishing in the energy research space and it was based on a range of energy research uh, journals at the time uh, and in addition to that um, there was an anecdotal suggestion that kind of led to the research that we carried out between the um, research funders so UK research and innovation um, the UK Energy Research Centre and ourselves, that there was potentially a particular issue within the energy portfolio that was seen to be less diverse than some other similar disciplinary um, areas. And so one of our aims was to explore whether that's the case and to explore what some of the drivers to that might be. Um, and also there's obviously clearly this uh, a narrative around you know, the climate emergency and the need for energy systems to transform hugely rapidly. Um, and in order to do that, research clearly will play um, a central role and we need to mobilise 100% of the uh, possible talent and we need to bring in new ideas and new perspectives. And I think those sorts of rationales that you see um, throughout kind of um, formal policy documents and kind of advocacy as well, draw on this kind of instrumental rationale in terms of delivering better research but also moral rationales in that the huge societal changes that we are going to need to go through to um, decarbonize society needs to draw on and reflect the population um, that will be impacted. So that covers kind of why we were focusing on energy research in terms of what we did for this study we um, carried out analysis of um, the data that we could collect and I'll talk about some of the challenges of collecting that data in a moment. So we looked at who's applying for funding that we can define broadly as energy research within the UK. So we looked at principal investigators and co-investigators. Um, we looked at who then receives funding. We looked at studentships and we looked at peer review panels for funding applications and that was over an eight year period. In addition to that uh, quantitative data analysis, we um, carried out a range of semi-structured interviews with 29 um, female energy researchers. I will note that we didn't interview male researchers. It's something we considered. I think it would be a really interesting um, aspect to bring into the research, but this was quite a contained research project, as I mentioned. So we focused on recruiting diversity of female energy researchers across career stage, and you can see the split of career stage there, across uh, host universities across the UK, so across 19 universities, um, and across discipline as well. <clears throat> and we then also carried out two focus groups with a total of 30 uh, female early career researchers, and that particularly recruited through the partnering we did um, at the event where we ran the focus groups um, with diverse researchers in terms of um, race um, and age and background. So there were the three methods that we employed. And then to say a little bit about data and the kind of challenges of analysing energy research. Um, so within the UK, and I'm aware not everyone is necessarily researching in the UK context. So some of this um, might be either new to you or different to the research environment in which you work. Um, but within the UK, the UK Research and Innovation, which was brought together in 2017, I believe, um, aimed to bring together the different research councils and the energy portfolio is held um, within the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council. So clearly that has kind of an engineering um, focus but it's not the only place that energy research takes place, although they nominally lead the energy research, research portfolio and have the largest proportion of funding allocated to what's deemed to be energy research. Funding in reality that is linked to energy takes place across, I would say, all of the other, virtually all of the other um, research councils. Um, and personally, myself as a social scientist, um, 
I do occasionally apply to funding streams through EPSRC, but I'm much more likely, for example, to apply to um, ESRC, so Economic and Social Research Council or something like that. So one of our challenges was, was trying to capture that uh, variability of data. So uh, uh, one of the key issues we found is that there's a very limited visibility of data on uh, equality, diversity and inclusion for cross-cutting areas like energy research. And this is challenging because if we look at government strategies, if we look at our you know, big ambitions in terms of the challenges the world is focusing, is addressing, these are all kind of cross-cutting issues and climate and energy being a kind of very good example of that. And so the research councils in theory can, be, can class research across all of the disciplines with their relation to issues like climate, like energy, like justice. Um, but at the moment we haven't got the capacity to do that. So we had to go through a very laborious process of looking through multiple data sources. Um, it's also very um, intransparent, that data. So there's a lot of concerns, I think, within the Research Council about the level of data they can make available to other organisations. We had very extensive um, discussions and actually the research councils were very helpful in providing what they felt they could provide within um, data protection regulations but um, we tried to make an argument that we had a kind of public service um, rationale for ac accessing data um, on protected characteristics for analysis purposes but it was really challenging and time consuming to do that um, and the data we did receive there was some degree of kind of rounding and suppression methodologies applied to that to um, ensure the anonymity of um, individuals. So in the end, um, I won't go into a huge amount of detail about the data process we went through. Um, anyone who is interested, it's kind of all listed in, in the report. But we ended up kind of combining data from the UK Energy Research Centre, Energy Data Centre, which has across um, all research councils and disciplines a database of research and data from uh, the engineering and physical sciences research council and that was so we could analyze data in the most granular way and also make assessments of how much people are funded rather than just who's funded so what did we find well our headline findings were that um overall in um, research carried out within energy in the UK over that eight year period, application rates from women are, are low, although they're largely in line with academic populations. And I'll talk about that a bit more in a moment. When they apply, female academics generally, or equally, occasionally, sometimes more likely to be funded than male academics. And we saw um, kind of tentative evidence of um, earlier career women applying for fellowships being um, more successful than men. But we know there's a very significant drop off in women between studentships and the funded academic level. And there's quite strong evidence that the grants being applied for and awarded tended to be of a smaller value for women than for men. So to give you a bit more detail of that. So this is the data over the eight year period. So female applications are in green, uh, female awards are in blue, male applications in pink, male uh, awards in blue. Um, so the overall female academic population within EPSRC's portfolio is 17%. So female awards for energy research varied uh, from 13.5% female to 17.3%. So largely in line with what you'd expect in populations, but um, They've historically been, been slightly below the academic population and just now reaching that in recent years. And you can see 2016 to 2017, 18, there was a slight increase. Um, application and award rates tend to be quite similar and um, some small increases, as I say, in success rates very recently, but we're limited in our ability to be able to do kind of statistical analysis on that data, partly because um, we would have liked uh, a longer pathway of data with more years, but also because of uh, the suppression methodology that I talked about a little bit earlier. And when we expand that picture to include the uh, broader research council data, so um, the social sciences as well, we actually see a very similar picture, which I think was quite surprising for some people, because there's this perception that social sciences are far more diverse than more engineering based disciplines. Um, and there was a very slight change, so uh, closer to 20% 
um, application rates and awards, but actually it was a, a hugely similar picture for social scientists and physical scientists researching energy. But who gets the highest value grants? It's not just who's applying, and who's getting funded. It's also about this, you know, perceived prestige from the very large grants. And when we look at that data uh, for grants under £250,000, 46% of women were receiving grants within um, that band, uh, as opposed to 34% of men. Uh, for grants below 1 million, so 86% of women were receiving grants that were of less than 1, women, 1 million pounds, whereas 76% of men. Um, the balance between um, 1 to 10 million was more similar, but it's significant to note that no women were allocated grants of over 10 million pounds. And that's where we saw quite a different, uh, it's quite a big difference because there was um, a not insignificant number of men who were awarded those highest value, highest prestige grants. Uh, and this has actually been supported following on from this work. EPSRC themselves did a review of their grant, particularly focusing on their large grant portfolio and identified this as a particular area of concern and a particular area that they want to tackle. So the review came out quite, quite late in 2020 and they haven't kind of subsequently updated action, but it's certainly been identified as an area of concern more broadly for EPSRC, but particularly for energy as well. So going on to the interviews and focus groups that we carried out and really the recommendations we make in our report draw really strongly on the experiences of um, the 59 women that we engaged with as we were carrying out this work um, and we talked to them about their experiences of their career, their experience of funding, whether they think gender has played a, a role in their career and their ideas for um, how you could improve gender balance going forward. Um, and I really liked this image that I've um, taken from the Grogan report that I mentioned slightly earlier, that I think um, draws on this idea of the leaky pipeline and the fact that there are multiple kind of rupture points along a career path when women might uh, either experience discrimination or might experience other barriers or biases that impact on their career. And certainly we saw in our interviews and focus groups that the participants very consistently described implicit and explicit biases. And this isn't to say that there wasn't um, the reporting of lots of good practice about research cultures and institutional cultures, but an overwhelming thing that the perception of the women we spoke to was that gender played a role in their career. And actually the kind of, the weight of that evidence, I think all of us involved in the um, research program found really surprising. Um, there was little variation across discipline. Um, it was slightly stronger reported in engineering disciplines and social science disciplines in terms of the kind of um, explicit biases, but there's very limited um, difference across career stages. And one of the kind of most powerful messages I took from this research was the number of explicit biases that were reported by, by these women. And we were particularly struck by non-British women with children reporting how they were experiencing some of these explicit biases. So, you know, some quite open questioning of how they were balancing their different uh, responsibilities in their career. And then this kind of behind that, this implicit um, or their perce perceived understanding of this implicit questioning of um, if they didn't work the longest hours possible, if they didn't demonstrate the absolute kind of highest commitment, that there'll be a question mark over their future visa funding. And I think that it was really challenging to hear that from those women. Um, other sorts of explicit biases reported were around the questioning of expertise based on gender, uh, direct questioning around plans for having children, uh, and people being told that they are the tokenistic woman or that they've only been employed on the post because they're a woman. So um, quite a surprising level of explicit bias reported from the women we spoke to. Um, I won't talk through all of the recommendations we came up with. The report details 30 recommendations in total over four themes, but the core was this idea that existing practice, and there is a huge amount of work going on to address um, 
equality, diversity and inclusion broadly and gender specifically, but that often that's focused on kind of individual barriers or individual interventions and that results in incremental change and that was a huge source of frustration for many uh, women we spoke to. And actually there was this kind of desire for funding based and systemic issues to be tackled. So the 30 recommendations uh, were split over these themes of looking at the data around transparency, monitoring and metrics, funding more women, and I'll talk about that more in a moment, stimulating career progression and building on what is working. Um, and, you know, we already know a great deal about um, the important points of engagement and intervention. So in terms of recommendations around data, um, we made some very clear recommendations around tracking, analysing and sharing openly data around all sources of diversity. Um, and I think that's an ongoing discussion in many research councils, and I, I hope that's something that will be integrated as we go forward. But we would also argue that the numbers of women or men or any other diversity indicator only show you so much. And that actually there was really an, um, an underappreciation of the value of exploring the lived experience of researchers in this space. Um, and that was a really valuable exercise to do. Lots of other researchers have started to doing, but to do it, but there was a need for that to be kind of mainstreamed into uh, how policy for EDI is actually shaped. And we argue that actually bringing together this quantitative and qualitative data to find out where the key intervention points, so you know, fixing those that leaky pipeline is actually really key. And doing that with our work showed us, for example that the trend towards large grants and big consortia bids within much energy research impacts particularly on female academics. So we advocate for that as a really um, useful way of understanding where action can be most effective. In terms of funding more women, we uh, made numerous uh, recommendations, some of which were very straightforward in terms of getting the basics right around how uh, everybody can access funding. So making sure calls are accessible in terms of um, timing and process. And there was uh, still a surprising reliance on invite only funding events, for example, or funding calls that were very short term or relied on very established uh, networks prior to the call being uh, announced. But also the basics around um, assessing part-time working in career breaks in terms of how funding proposals um, are assessed at peer review. So in theory, um, these are the basics. We also made a number of recommendations, or more specifically, our participants made a number of recommendations around innovating in funding structures. So peer, the peer review process for grant applications, um, whilst having huge benefits, is, is extremely resource intensive. And we need to acknowledge that it is also subject to a range of biases and inconsistencies um, and that there are alternative ways of assessing funding structures that should be studied in more detail. And there's a, there's a huge variety of those. And I've, I've linked to two articles there that um, include a really interesting debate and links to some of the um, data and studies on alternatives to peer review for allocating funding, but it can include things like quotas, ring fencing funding for particular uh, groups, uh, things like developing narrative CVs, so um, track record is assessed differently, and importantly, uh, more ambitious or radical, depending on how you look at it, things like lottery systems. Um, and this is not to say that all research funding should be funded through this route, but there was a lack of, look, of looking at, okay, what are the innovative ways of allocating funding? How can we trial them and test them and see what the impact is on EDI? Um, and we, we advocated for that to happen on a, a broader basis. And that particularly targeting schemes at early career researchers could be particularly effective, um, partly because these funds tend to be smaller, um, but also because we know that ECR group is more diverse across um, general, most uh, characteristics, including gender. Um, and at the other end of the spectrum, having more targeted work to, 
to support women to apply for the largest and most prestigious grants. Um, and we know that generally women leading large grants bring in more women. Those grants tend to be longer, so it provides um, a really good incubation period for early career women to work with senior women to uh, develop their funding capacity. Ooh. And on career progression, this is where these kind of issues of um, structural and cultural um, barriers really came to the fore. Um, and our participants really stressed kind of valuing academic citizen, citizenship, including uh, thinking about measures of recognition and esteem. And we know from numerous studies that service roles in academia tend not to be equally shared. So that service roles, both to students within the department and in service of the wider discipline um, tend to fall disproportionately on women. Um, in line with that, the idea um, of what success looks like in academia needs to be challenged to address the work-life balance. These are particularly current issues in the UK, obviously, given the UCU, the University College Union, uh, recent strikes, including on pay and work-life balance. Um, so that long uncontracted hours are considered synonymous with productivity and commitment. And in line with that, um, the widespread use of fixed term contracts has particular impacts on early career researchers and on diversity. Um, so that's a very brief summary of our recommendations. But again, in line with my earlier comment about this isn't a new story, our recommendations, we would argue, are not groundbreaking. They build on a very significant body of evidence relating to gender bias in academia. So what does this study go on to tell us about the nature of how academic work and academic institutions are gendered? Um, so we would suggest that our findings kind of illustrate the gendering of academic institutions very fully. So this is a very well-established uh, concept developed by ACCA in the early 90s that considers how the appearance of gender neutrality is maintained in the face of gendered structures. So the idea that there's acknowledgement that might be individual problems, but this kind of um, focusing on individual problems rather than issues with the whole structures. So those inequalities tend to be legitimized the use of symbolic policies and a lack of cultural and structural change. And they're also legitimized through ideas of the ideal worker being subtly established and institutionalized, but also internalized within academic staff, both through uh, ideological and habitual processes as well. So I'll go into a little bit more detail to see how this was understood within our research process. So in terms of the symbolic policies and how that played out, out in terms of the gendering of higher education, there was this focus on overt processes. So for example, the representation of um, different genders on review panels, rather than focusing on more covert processes, for example, addressing the mechanisms through which applications are structured and assessed themselves. Um, also issues implicit within that regarding the lack of clarity on assessing career breaks. So although there might be a narrative that, um, you know, we will make sure that career breaks do not impact on um, any researcher. Actually, when you look into the detail of that, there's very uh, limited clear guidance on how that should be assessed within peer review um, or in promotion. There was a self-improvement focus, so this idea that um, marginalised groups should be accessing mentoring and training and self-improvement opportunities. And then finally, the fact that practice was often not in line with policy. So although there'll be policies around um, how funding calls should be run, often the timescales of them or um, invite any events or the operation of these kind of competitive sand pits were not aligned with actually those um, written policies. And so to offer you some quotes from our interviewees, one of our um, participants suggested that although universities say all the right things, there are, and there are provisions in place and generally colleagues are very understanding, all of that is outweighed by the nature of the system, which is one where you, the harder you work, the more you publish, the better it is. Second participant suggested that it's 
absolutely great to provide support and mentoring for individual women, but not as a way of papering over the cracks in the system. And the third participant suggested that they start to worry if all the emphasis is put on what women need to do to improve their own careers. So essentially you make it an individualistic problem and not a systemic problem. So to expand on how those kind of symbolic policies interact with research culture and not how we conceive of what an ideal academic might be, um, I think uh, Sang and colleagues um, kind of summarize it really well that this idea of the uh, ideal academic is projected as someone who works long hours, is willing and able to travel, is research active and productive and embedded within social networks that enhance promotion prospects. And that framing of the ideal academic worker tends to under-recognize collegiate working, pastoral work, and that broader kind of service agenda that we mentioned earlier. And again, <clears throat> um, although there might be this kind of narrative around kind of rounded academics that work across internal service, service to their discipline, um, the framing of the excellence gender as focused on metrics undermines that. And we saw that experienced through our interviewees, through them stating that the culture within academ academia is one of big beasts. They tend to be big male beasts who set the tone for what happens. And that compared to other working environments, there are some behaviors that are not as well prized. Being a really good contributor to a team and to collective problem solving and communication and engagement type skills, which are typically feminine skills and behaviors are not as prized in academic circles. And then I, I particularly like this quote, women, one participant suggested that women like me do not need advice on how to compete with men or how to be more Mars, but on how to find a place in a system that wasn't made for us. And then finally, this perception that academic careers are assessed ultimately on how hard you are prepared to work. Um, so, I hope through this presentation, I've offered you kind of an overview of what was ultimately quite a contained um, research project focusing specifically on this idea of gender within um, energy research within the UK um, and some of the findings that we, we got from the women that we spoke to. In conclusion, I think that the participants we worked with did recognize really clearly the structural and cultural issues within higher education and research, but they felt relatively power, powerless to resist these entrenched ideal academic framings. Despite that, there, there were kind of themes of efforts at resistance through their own networks, and many women that we spoke to talked about the power of, of setting up their own networks sometimes with other women, sometimes with other early career people, sometimes with other people that have, you know, similar aspirations and ways of working and, and ways of subverting what they felt was um, this ideal academic framing. And there was also people trying to develop workarounds. So sometimes that was uh, women telling us about how they tried to almost uh, disguise career breaks that they might have had in their CV, or it was, as I say, uh, leaning on these networks, trying to develop uh, alternative routes to developing ambitious funding proposals into the future. And many, many of the people we spoke to flagged the importance of feminist, not necessarily female leaders. And that was through both um, the experiences of some of the women we spoke to, that having leaders that feel that they can um, create a culture within their research group that values different ways of working that are more conducive, um, to people, for example, with caring responsibilities or have had career breaks or who don't want that hyper individualized uh, academic culture was really powerful. Um, I'd obviously flag, and I haven't really kind of talked about it in great deal, but the progress is needed now more than ever. We have seen increasing studies come out over recent months about the impact of COVID on the publishing and research activity of women in particular. We also know that the particular lack of progress on racism, particularly on the intersection of gender and racism within academia, um, and there's been um, various reports published over the last six months, but the one I linked to there particularly is um, a group of 10 um, black female academics that wrote an open letter to UKRI well over a year ago now, demonstrating concern that um, 
funding to consider the intersection between COVID and ethnicity. Uh, none of that funding went to black researchers and there was also concerns about um, the lack of data being collected on EDI in that process and, uh, and also the operation of the panel to some extent. Um, and that is, uh, I think, being taken seriously by UKRI, but I think it's also fair and accurate to point out that the UKRI took over a year to respond to that open letter. So um, I would love to say that I felt that it had been huge progress in the two years since we did this report, and it's, uh, but I think um, there's still huge challenges. I would flag that I think there is some really interesting progress in that um, this theme of large centres being increasingly um, where research funding is um, funneled to being challenging for diversity and gender, I think is true. But also we have some really interesting large centres, UCOAT being one of them, there's the CRED Centre in, in um, the UK, Supergen Hubs and many others. They're actually now starting to think quite ambitiously about how they address EDI, both through um, flexible funding pots, some really interesting um, specifically kind of allocated research and also networks that they uh, seek to develop and fund. So I think although large funding centres can be uh, challenging for diversity, I think there is potential for them to be off a kind of uh, uh, exciting routes to tackling some of these diversity issues as well. Um, I also think that energy in particular is a, is a particularly exciting area to think about um, diversity and inclusion because the links between academics and non-academics could be really dynamic area. So a lot of my work is to do with uh, policymakers and industry. They tend to be uh, quite often quite a diverse lot, particularly in industry. There's a lot of exciting work going on in the energy industry on diversity, but equally work with um, advocacy organisations and activists could be an exciting space where you bring together more diverse academics and more diverse uh, practitioners and research participants. Um, and I think that's an exciting area for um, future research and activity. And then finally, I'd say that clearly we need systemic and not symbolic actions. And I hope I haven't presented too much of a negative picture here because I think there is a lot of positive action taking place. But I'd also argue that we are part of that, all part of that kind of systemic action as well. Um, and it's not just from the formal institutions and from the very highest leadership. It's about the kind of norms and conversations and choices that we all make. And I know that um, Jenny Stevens spoke a little bit earlier in this um, webinar series about her book on diversifying, diversifying power and anti-racist and feminist leadership on climate and energy. And I see these two agendas as really closely aligned and certainly there's this desire, I think, to act from increasing number of senior academics and the potential for a better allyship between academics at different um, stages and levels and disciplines, I, I think has a lot of potential going into the future. So I think I will draw it to close there. Um, we've got a load of references, but people can look at them at their leisure if they're interested. And I can um, stop sharing. There you go. Thank you, Jess. That was absolutely fantastic. I'm sure that well, I can see some uh, some hand clapping emojis here, um, kind of, uh, I think, echoing um, our, my thanks. Um, really interesting and really kind of uh, careful analysis here and really important um, stuff, I think, um, uh, to, to be thinking about. Does anybody have any questions? If not, I've got a, I've got a question, but... Um, I'm of secondary importance. Okay, maybe I'll, I'll ask a question uh, while other people are, are considering. Um, I'm sorry if I if this is, is something I missed, Jess, but um, you're talking uh, you, you're talking at one point about kind of different um, areas of research that uh, uh, and kind of mapping out different areas of research within kind of. Um, the, the field of energy studies. What um, did you identify any patterns in kind of kind of gendered patterns in terms of what kinds of research topics uh, are covered at all? Yeah, it's a really it's a really interesting question. And which so we didn't delve into the theming the individual research um, of men and women. 
what we did look at is whether there was a difference between the data we had on um, research being allocated through engineering and physical sciences versus mm. economic and social sciences. That's not exact by any means because, you know, there's blurred boundaries between them. And I think increasingly the big pots of funding that might come through uh, EPSRC d uh, are increasingly required to include social sciences. But I think it's significant to note that quite often the PI is not a social scientist, which has its own power dynamic within it. Um, and that actually, there wasn't a significant difference in terms of um, funding levels between ESRC and EPSRC in terms of females. And I think a lot of people, myself probably included, would have projected that there would, might be uh, a bigger differential, given that the you know, uh, received wisdom is that the social sciences are more diverse. Um, if you look at populations, then tend to be higher in social sciences. But I think it's an interesting question in terms of, you know, the detail of what people are researching as well. But we didn't look at that. Yeah, and it's something that I think, I mean, we talked about in previous um, webinars here that uh, is notable how few men are doing kind of are involved in the debate around gender and, and energy and probably kind of more broadly gender uh, across the, the social sciences. Um, Re reflected as well in uh kind of how many male speakers we've we've managed to recruit for this webinar series um rosie apologizes she's got to disappear off for the school run um we've got a couple of questions here we've got one from natalie and then then we've got kevin uh who's raised his hand let's start with, with natalie because she just she's just going first natalie do you want to to read out your question or do you want me to read it Silence indicates that maybe I should read it. Um, okay, so Natalie asks, how was uh, woman slash female de defined? Do you have any comments uh, regarding representation of non-binary, non-cis uh, in your study and in the research energy sector? Yeah, so it's a really good question. I think um, partly this gets to the core of some of the issues I was raising around transparency of data. So the data we drew on is based on uh, self-identification of the researchers. So they um, offer or not. So you can, you know, there, there was a proportion of um, researchers who chose not to offer any information about their uh, personal characteristics. But, you know, people are identifying as um, gender through self-identification. But because quite of the rounding and suppression methodology applied by the research councils and their concerns about sharing this data outside, even with research organizations outside of the research councils, meant that um, populations below certain levels, we had no data on, and that includes people that might be uh, identifying as non-binary, we had no data on because it was below the threshold that got suppressed through the um, rounding and suppression methodology. So it's a huge challenge to engage with these issues if there is no transparency in the data. Clearly there is transparency within research councils and I'd hope that they would they would start publishing a far more detailed narrative on some of the detail behind not just this issue but you know the numerous issues that aren't visible until you unless you have the raw data. Um, so I think that's one of the challenges. I think the, the other thing I would say is that we were extremely aware of a myriad of other, of extremely important issues that we weren't addressing in our research. Um, so issues around um, sexuality, around gender and non-binary, around intersectionality, around the representation of men in our study, all of which we're very aware aren't included, but. I would say that we have a, we had a very specific focus within this research, and one of the things we really advocated for is one greater learning for the from the huge body of research in other sectors uh, into policy, but also for our research to be a platform onto other things. Um, and it was great to see EPS, EPSRC looking in more detail at um, what was happening in the large bids. The other thing I failed to mention as well that I think is a really positive development within the UK is. EPSRC have um, had a call out uh, in the last six months that hasn't been allocated yet to develop a networking fund on EDI in its broadest sense. So that is um, over a million pounds. But the idea is that is to act as a hub. Um, it's, it's not energy specific. It's across 
Actually, no, it is energy specific. So energy within EPFRC to bring together some of these issues, to think about the nuance and to have various streams to look at different issues uh, beneath equality, diversity and inclusion in its broadest sense. So that's one positive development in the last kind of six months. Thanks, Jess. Um, and Natalie passes on their thanks as well. Um, we've got a question from Kevin. Um, if you want to turn on your mic and camera, Kevin, or just your mic. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I, I'm sorry, I, I joined late today, um, but I caught the, the end of your talk, Jess, and um, you know, it's very interesting to, to hear what you were saying. So I, uh, because I missed most of the talk, and I apologise. I'm not sure if this if this comment is entirely relevant. But um, earlier in the year, I did um, a load of interviews with senior, what we would call senior social scientists uh, about the impacts of COVID uh, on on the social sciences, and and that was I, I was working with Lancaster University and the Academy of Social Sciences at the time. I've left that project now. Um, just to say that, you know, the, the, the gendered impacts of COVID on, on academics came up a lot in, in that research. Um, I, I, wrote, I wrote up a report on it, but it was an internal report. Um, but you could get in touch with Rita Gardner at the Academy of Social Sciences if you wanted to sort of pursue that. And you know, if she puts you back in touch with me, then I could possibly share with you some of the relevant findings if she thinks it's okay. And then the other thing was, in the course of doing that research, that research I also got in touch with a woman called um, Chris, that's K-R-I-S, Kovarovich at Durham. And she also goes by the name of Fire, which is quite cool. Um, and, and she did some research which would tie into the same sort of themes. And I suppose one of the one of the interesting things that came out was also compounding that was the you know the the, the prevalence of women in in social science as opposed to other disciplines, which you know of course is 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 in itself somewhat problematic with respect to the other disciplines. Of course, this meant that the social sciences were particularly impacted by this gendered impact of um, of COVID. Um, so I don't know if that fits into your framing at all in terms of what you were talking about today, but if, if it does, then I'm pleased about that. <laughs> That's really helpful, yeah. So that was one of the things I was saying is that um, our research was very much a snapshot when we did it, and I'm very conscious that uh, there's increasing evidence of the gendered impact of COVID in, COVID in research, as you say. And I think certainly the studies I've seen, a lot of them have been looking um, particularly at uh, medicine, but um, but, and, but far less on social sciences. So it's really helpful to hear that those that sort of work is going on in terms of how it okay. plays out in terms of the social sciences. So yeah, if there's something published, I'd be really interested to read it, or maybe you could share it in this chat. I'm sure others would be interested as well. Yeah, it's not published. What I wrote was just, it was internal. Uh, you know, for the project. Um, so as I say, I, I, I could get in touch with, with Rita perhaps and, you know, see if she'd mind me sharing something with you from that, but um, yeah, I can have a go. But, you know, do, do try and get in touch with, with Chris, Chris Kovarovich at, at Durham. Um, she did some research that, you know, which, um, fits into the same frame that we've been just discussing. Yeah, that's with a with a C, Kovarovich. At the end. Yeah. Kovarovich, yes. Okay. Great. I, I, I just <laughs> when I was looking for her just now, I googled Fire and Durham University, and she and she popped up. So I could I could remember Fire, but I couldn't remember. <laughs> so you you I guess you'll be able to track her down. Thank you. And thanks, that is, yeah, it's an important topic, isn't it? Lovely, Thank, thanks, Kevin. Um, okay, we've got a couple of couple of other questions, or well, one comment from Ntabi, who says that um, uh, the, the issue isn't unique to the UK at all, but it's a really important uh, problem, and that 
even when the conditions are changing and more opportunities are provided for women in energy research, this is often not enough because there are many other aspects that need to be addressed. Um, it's definitely not only about numbers. Uh, I don't know whether you want to comment on that or whether not. <laughs> uh, uh, just, just to, to completely agree, to completely <laughs> agree, really. And I think this, um, this issue about international comparators, I find interesting as well. So there's lots of studies looking at the context in in different countries, whether it's the UK or wherever. But I would say there's a dominance certainly in studies looking at Europe and North America, which in itself is a problem. But I think I found, or at least we found as a project team looking at the literature, there was a lack of, of studies looking at what works internationally. There was a lot of studies looking at what are the problems in different contexts, but I think something that compares a, around what works, it maybe links to one of the other questions as well, internationally would be um, a really interesting exploration as well. Uh, okay, uh, we, we've got a, a comment from, or a question from Pascal. It, this seems quite a large question. Um, what, are the uh, what are the mechanisms in the UK for researchers to change uh, uh, to, to change things uh, around this situation. So um, uh, Pascal mentions kind of uh, union and kind of advocacy and things like that. But um, yeah, a question about the, the mechanisms through which change can be facilitated. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd invite others to comment on this <laughs> as well, because it's such a huge question. Like I, I kind of mentioned the current um, industrial and ongoing industrial action within the UK and um, equality and gender pay gap is part of that current industrial action. So certainly there's you know extensive work happening through the unions. I'd also say that there's a programme, I think it's just a UK programme, I've never really thought about it, but the Athena Swan programme that seeks um, to take forward gender equality initiatives within universities. I would say that within the research we did, our participants had mixed perceptions of that program, that there was um, you know, an understanding that had some really clear benefits in terms of institutionalizing, um, talking about these issues, um, but that there was limitations to what those sorts of um, arrangements can do and quite often they ended up depending on you know the broader operation of that department or that institution a kind of box ticking or limited in their ambition so uh, and there's lots of initiatives like that there's lots of initiatives within individual funders there's lots of really exciting networks where people have got together to try and say you know what could we do that is going to be beneficial for our community and that's all wonderful I, I guess where the problem is is how those things come together to something more systemic that benefits women but benefits the whole research population like i said at the beginning that a lot of these issues you know are about creating a research environment that is better for everyone and that is more attractive to the best talent and i think it's a real challenge for higher education at the moment within the uk i'm sure internationally as well about how how you create an environment that it is attractive given that there are lots of alternatives out there so yeah if other people want to contribute on what opportunities for um advocacy or action are then i'd be really interested to hear that as well pascal you've raised your your hand was there something you want to add there Yes, um, basically what I'm having trouble understanding is like why there's so many, why does it get so bad in terms of representation in the UK? Um, because I'm based in Finland and I recognize some of the problems also that we have in Finland. I mean, we're far from gender equal um, <laughs> and other kinds of equal, um, but uh, we have like, we have more maybe interaction with our universities depending also well it depends also on the the governance of the university but um uh typically like salaries and things are negotiated by unions as group agreements anyway so any problems are also negotiated as part of salary agreements um so you know if you want the rights to certain kinds of leave or you know a certain kind of equality or whatnot then it can be written in the national level kind of agreement and this is negotiated every year um, and um, 
students also in some universities have a say in the governance of the university. There are actually panels and boards and uh, they are quite powerful usually in Finland. And um, uh, also the role of the press is quite important. So if a university messes up, then the students usually go to the press and then everybody knows that the university has messed up and everybody's pointing the finger at the university. Um, and uh, <laughs> and Finns are very easily socially embarrassed. So um, this is actually, being on the naughty step is actually, you know, it's, it's, it's a big thing in Finland. Um, and um, then um, uh, there's some, um, Oh, I've forgotten what my third point was going to be. Um, I've just completely forgotten. So I'm wondering, why does it not work in the UK? Why is there, I mean, academia in the UK has just been getting worse and worse and worse for the past 30 years. Um, so <laughs> that's one of the reasons why I'm in, in Finland. Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, and we also have marketization of universities here as well, and we also have problems. One of the highest rates of discrimination against women in the workplace, for instance, discrimination against foreigners, um, discrimination against people of color, not just foreign people of color, but even Finnish people of color in education. Um, and um, it's, you know, you never hear that about Finland outside of Finland, but there is plenty of uh, plenty of evidence for that. Um, but we we actually don't seem to be in as bad a place as as the UK. So I'm just wondering why does it? Oh yeah, and our funders also listen to us when we when we tell them what the problems are. They <laughs> they generally try and improve things, <laughs> like the Academy of Finland, for instance. It's maybe because it's also quite a small country, small population, so everybody knows everybody and. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's like a hugely interesting area, I think, about why research cultures do differ um, in, in different country contexts. And I think some of the issues you raised certainly uh, are part of that agenda. I think it's really interesting what you were saying about the press and the fact that there's that kind of social pressure to be seen to be addressing these issues, which I don't know, arguably maybe is less strong in the UK. Um, I think the marketization and commercialization agenda is, is particularly strong in the UK. And there's, you know, may, other, maybe others that have been in the HEI um, sphere for more decades than I can comment on how things have changed over time more fully. But I think there's also issues around um, kind of slowness of change of structures as well. So we have the research excellence, excellence framework within the UK, which um, can, you know, measures re research success. Um, and th there's various metrics in there that have been changed over time and softened, including kind of assessment of journal impact factors that are explicitly not included now, but as that it kind of persists within institutional culture. So you get this change kind of within central things. And I think that's actually really slow to, to filter down into how departments, but also how individuals assess their own success. So I think there's an in interesting thing about how you um, roll out change faster and embed it faster. And I, I'm, I'm not sure about how that differs between um, country contexts. So yeah, if other people might want to comment as well. Because I, I was also wondering, like, I've noticed even in Finland that the, the inequality sets in way before it gets to the point where you're, you know, a postdoc applying for funding effectively. I've seen um, uh, bachelor students already facing some kind of discrimination in terms of the assignments they get. You know, the men get the juicy assignments from the male professors and the females get kind of a little bit of the, they, they don't get the same opportunities in terms of assignments. Um, I've seen cases in master students, for instance, where when they're doing the main thesis that if it's a female student, she will be set on assignment so hard for her master's thesis that she will not be able to get the top grade. She will get a good middle grade, even though she's worked probably harder than any of the guys on the less assignment. Um, so it looks like she's less able than the guys, but she's been set a much higher level assignment. Um, at doctoral level, like the the discrimination is just I've seen things where the um, you know if 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 you when when you're supposed to be set stuff aside your research for some experience you will be given secretarial work organizing conferences or whatnot um, rather than some of the more juicy stuff than the guys get um, so 
as a result, a lot of less women make it to the kind of academic level or becoming an academic level because they are already set to fail by have been given lower grades, by being given less exciting stuff to do. Um, <laughs> and it starts way before a career in research. Yeah, and I think the Kathleen Grogan study that I um, highlighted in the presentation kind of draws on some of the evidence around those very early points in terms of recommendation letters and all sorts of things that are very early in someone's academic career but kind of set that trajectory and that incrementally have a, a really big impact. Um, I guess two other things I was going to say is, is talking about energy research, I think there's an interesting question about, and we touched on it earlier when like we said about you know, the physical sciences versus social sciences, but that, you know, that's obviously far too kind of blunt. This idea of kind of multiple energy communities within mm. energy research and, and the need to understand the different dynamics in those communities a lot more, I think. But I think your comment about this kind of early career stage is, is really important as well, that, you know, there was some tentative evidence in the data we had around it looking like women start, were starting to be more successful at early career fellowship level like it's very it was very early to say that but there was some evidence of that um and clearly that's where, where a lot of the kind of pivotal changes in people's careers happen as well um so I see that as kind of a, a area for a lot of positivity hopefully you know a lot of people in very senior positions it's a very long trajectory in academia isn't it but actually you've got this kind of uh, cohort of more diverse um women and men um, at that early career stage that will be filtering through in the years. And I don't know, maybe maybe it was, that's happened earlier in Finland, I don't know. Um, I don't know. What, one of the problems that we have actually in Finland is that um, uh, foreign researchers have much less opportunity than Finnish born researchers. And this is actually reflected in the funding structures as well for doing for doctoral education, for instance. So if you are a foreign researcher, you may come to Finland because you've been awarded a PhD scholarship. Um, and when you get here, you actually find that actually you may not have your full funding. It can be stopped at pretty much any moment. Um, and uh, there's also some pressures because to work in Finland, you have to be fluent in Finnish. There is so much discrimination that even if you are fluent in Finnish, it's actually very difficult to get a job. And even if you speak fluent Swedish, which is the other uh, um, uh, official language in Finland, it is still hard to get a job. Even Swedish speaking Finns have trouble getting, they face discrimination all the time. Um, and uh, so, for instance, a lot of, well, the people, who, very few people do a PhD in Finland. It's a very prestigious thing to do to have a doctorate. And it tends to be, there's, there's a, uh, a sort of class effect that it's pretty much like uh, upper, upper, upper classes in Helsinki that tend to do these things. Um, people with money um, and uh, they typically, the, most of the Finns, I would say, do their PhD while they've already got a job in a company and they are funded by the company to do their PhD as they are working. So they already have access to all the career possibilities afterwards. Mm -hmm. The idea is that you're basically developing your career with a PhD. Um, but if you're a foreigner coming to Finland doing your PhD, then once you've done your PhD, it's actually a huge problem getting funding afterwards or getting a job afterwards. And you're kind of a little bit stuck if you want to stay in Finland. Um, so this is something that's being worked on by the unions through this process where the unions talk to the universities as part of these um, um, agreements on, on salaries and working conditions and all that uh, to try and improve things and to talk also to to funders also to be more aware and um, change some things. And um, uh, and also inside the universities, the student guilds, um, the, the doctoral student associations, um, they actually have a say right up to very high levels. They have votes. Um, they can also work with unions um, and they, they do. Um, and there's perhaps more of that in Finland, I think, than in the UK. We have lawyers, you know, than, and things and by the time something goes to the press then that means things have have been really bad because if it's we have strong laws on slander for instance so we have to be very careful about going to the press it's not something you can do easily unless it can be followed with journalistic processes um so um yeah um 
So that's why I'm wondering in the UK, maybe there's not enough going on inside the universities for students to change things. Mm. Yeah, it's really interesting to hear a bit more about Finland. I'd love to see something that was like a full comparator. It would be fascinating. Really interesting conversation, guys. Thanks, Pascal. Uh, Mathilde, we've got, um, got a question from you. If you, uh, I don't know whether you're building on this uh, conversation. Yeah, I was building on this conversation um, because, well, I'm a very early. And I can think I will start my PhD next year and I've only got two masters, um, one that I did in France and one that I did in the UK. And uh, despite this uh, picture that you're painting in the UK, that is still so much progress to be made. I just wanted to say uh, that compared to what you, the conversation you had with Finland and everything, uh, France is absolutely terrible on that front. Mm -hmm. It's it's worse than um, it's worse than the UK, and it's to the point that um, you, there's some subject that you can't mention if you want to get. A, funded so like intersectionality something that at the moment is a banned word from the French public debates so that's something that wouldn't be but yeah exactly Pascal I know it's it's quite I was I was thinking when you started talking that you'd be um French and I saw you'd be talking about French friends but then you were talking about Finland I was like oh Finland sounds really amazing um and yeah uh, France is absolutely like so current like so I've been refused um, uh, a PhD uh, a topic in France on the basis that I wanted to include gender in the so that's something that you 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 go to someone and they tell you oh you want to talk about gender no there's there's no way we'll ever do that that's not something we're going to do and has, that been, about... has that been a change like previously was work so it in gender and you know other issues so gender is what there's there's been a change i think in the past 10 years i believe i'd say and the other thing is that intersectionality is intersectionality and intersectionality studies always had a bad press in France. It's been something that um, even from academics that belong to that more like that social scientists that have more of a, of a you know, left uh, political attachment, let's say. Um, it's something that has been a big debate with Bourdieu and Boudon and everything. The idea is that uh, there's a really big part of French older academics that consider that doing intersectionality and considering race and gender takes away from considering the differences between social classes. And so even people that would be willing to understand these kind of um, dynamics and systemic dynamics are reluctant to look into it when it comes to it. Which is quite surprising when you think that actually in terms of private sector in France uh, and companies and everything, women and gender equality at least pay in terms of pay has been progressing quite well. Mm. So yeah, just 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 wait to give a bit of a yeah, it's a contrasting to, to, yeah, it's brilliant to hear the the kind of contrasting thing, and I think it and it is so complex, kind of linking what research and higher education is doing in that context of like broader political and social landscapes, and it, it is shifting all the time. But I think it's interesting what you're saying about that there's other aspects of French society that are more successful in terms of um, uh, pay in the private sector and that's particularly intriguing. Yeah that's that's why it's uh, it's quite intriguing is that you go into the public funded sectors but then like the public funding in France is just quite weird you see uh, people that get like Yes, I was listening to this man who works for the Pasteur Institute who was developing some kind of COVID resistant drugs. And we had seen his project refused to be like his project has had been 
discredited by the French state, saying they wouldn't fund it. And so he ended up have he ended up getting EU funds for it and getting published in Nature and then getting his drugs getting picked up by um, mm -hmm. private companies and everything because he works. But the French states in itself wouldn't fund him, saying there's no ground for that and we won't fund that because we don't think it's valuable. And it happens in not just in um, social sciences aspects of things, but also in heart science, it seems. Fantastic. Thanks, Matilda. Sorry that uh, um, uh, my computer started making noise then. Um, do we have any other questions? We're, we're kind of five minutes before the end. Um, it's been really nice to have a, have a good chat. Um, there's been some really nice kind of comments raised mm -hmm. here. Um, if nobody wants to chip in now, uh, I think you'll all join me in saying um, thank you very much, Jess. This has been an absolutely fantastic talk and um, really fascinating discussion. Um, we, we have one more webinar um, to come uh, next Friday. So taking you right up to the Christmas break, um, that's uh, um, our, uh, our first uh, kind of male presenter. Um, it's uh, entitled Nostalgic Masculinities and the Decline of Coal and Queer Futures in uh, the Appalachians. Uh, and that's with Gabe Schwarzman. Uh, from the University of California. So we look forward to seeing you all at that as well. Um, just want to end by kind of a, another kind of round of applause to Jess and um, look forward to, to seeing then. If, if um, can't see you this, uh, this coming Friday, um, we've got a cat who wants to come and say goodbye to you as well. Oh, thank you, thank uh, you. Um, then Merry Christmas and uh, we look forward to seeing you in the new year. Okay. Thank Take you, care, Jess. everyone. Um, interesting comments and questions. Yeah.